So we started doing labs. For those of you who don't know, we started doing labs uh, like this. Um, I guess it's been about six or seven months ago. Started doing that um, just as an opportunity for a monthly uh, catch up um, for us to be able to share some just content and uh, encouragement and support uh, because our, our desire is to build a community of like-minded leaders uh, that are able to encourage and support one another in the noble act of leading. Um, we believe in leaders. We think leadership is ultimately uh, a hope for our culture and community, for us to represent something that's bigger than ourselves, for us to represent a hope that we carry, uh, that we think others uh, will be encouraged by uh, to continue to do hard things that are worth doing because people matter. So that's part of what we're doing today. Ken and I, um, as we've outlined the next level leadership journey um, and the two parts of the journey out and the journey in, um, we really try to work uh, carefully to integrate um, what we call the journey out, which is towards strategy and technique of leading a sustainable, profitable uh, mid-market company, and the journey in, which really looks at looks inward at who we are as an individual and person, so that we can um, really lead wholeheartedly, um, where we can show up, where we're not having to pretend or perform or pretend to have things we don't, and exhausting ourselves trying to be what we think everybody else needs us to be, as opposed to humbly offering what we have um, and pointing people toward a, a vision that we're passionate about. So we love doing this stuff. We think about it, talk about it all the time. We think about you guys uh, and, and your work all the time. So excited to have another opportunity to be with you um, today. And uh, Ken is gonna be leading us uh, on this morning's adventure. So uh, unless there are any other questions or uh, introductory uh, announcements or needs, I'll uh, give it over to the master himself, Dr. K. Wayne Edmondson. Uh, there's uh, there's got to be some, uh, some legal uh, action I can take for people using my likeness as a background on their, <laughs> on their uh, Zoom calls. <laughs> Uh, there has yeah, to I be. Mean, How do I get rid? Google of is a wonderful thing. <laughs> How do I get rid there. of some of those some of those pictures from the past? Uh, all right. Uh, good to see all of you, and I'm, I, I appreciate uh, you joining in. Let's make this a meaningful uh, next 40, 45 minutes as I take you through some uh, historical information. Uh, the topic today is is really uh, almost a paradox. Are you leading a company or building a business? They seem like uh, you would think they would be the same thing. Uh, I'm going to make that distinction pretty clear here in a moment. I spend uh, a lot of time thinking and talking about this kind of thing. And a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking to you about today is coming from a, a study that uh, really was done about 20 years ago. Although we're gonna be talking about that history, it's very current today because we're comparing ourselves today to that history and a lot of that history has come forward. But Jim Collins and, and Jerry Porras, both who are uh, at the time they were doing this study were also uh, college professors doing this type of research. Uh, one of the books that you're familiar with that uh, Collins wrote, G uh, Good to Great, was prior to that, they built, uh, they wrote this book called <laughs> Built to Last, which has some uh, historical, now we would call it historical because it, it kind of took us into the early 2000s. And it gave us a traditional view of what leaders look like. Now, most of you on this call would uh, probably not be able to reach back into the 70s and 80s as I can do and, and into the 90s, some of you can. And there was a tremendous emphasis placed on what a leader looked like and what a leader oftentimes focused on. And that's what I wanna talk about today is what's the difference between a great leader uh, who focuses on the traditional view and one who's now focused on more uh, the what I would call the current or modern day view. Well, historically, I grew up with this model that great leaders had this big uh, personality. Uh, I could name lots of them. Some you would know, some may not resonate with you, but it's that uh, person, 
that personality, that uh, they were somewhat, you can see, unconventional. They were aggressive in the way they presented their vision. It seemed almost impossible that they could do these things. Uh, they were risk takers. Uh, they were just powerful personalities. And uh, that was what I grew up with. That is, that is the image of a great leader. Now, there is probably something of, about that that might strike you that strikes me is I don't feel like I'm that kind of person. I don't, I don't see myself being that way, never have. It's not a, a, a lack of self-confidence or a lack of ability as much as it is. That was the personality I learned to look toward. They, they, made, uh, they, they, they did a lot of things, <laughs> uh, but they were big, big personalities. And to their credit, oftentimes success followed them uh usually there was one significant summit of success and then there were other little ones around them perhaps and even their failures were considered to be not their their doing or they were given credit for even trying something so they weren't really evaluated based on uh the true leadership model they were ba they were really evaluated more on how, uh, I would always say, how bombastic they could be and how, how much press they could get and how many times they showed up on the front of some great magazine. Or it was, a, it was really an interesting time and it went on for a long time. And I call that the basic premise is that uh, to have a great organization, we have always said, well, there, you have to be a great leader. Uh, and, and that's true. Uh, I, I don't know of a great organization that doesn't have a great leader, but what I just defined as being the model I grew up with, that great leader that I grew up with, it's also creates that problem that says that great leaders don't always build great companies. And that's also true. It, it's, if you look at what the research has taught us and told us and even bring it forward into today's time, you see a lot of great personalities. And in order to build a great company, this is the kind of the, the, the paradox here, you've got to have a great leader. But what we define as a great leader doesn't always build great companies. I'm going to break that down for you in a little bit, but I want to give you some examples. Here are some examples of some great companies led our great leaders who led companies. Now, during their time as leaders, these companies that are on the, on the screen there were, were really iconic companies. They were, they were in the forefront. And you say, well, gee whiz, I don't recognize some of those companies. Well, uh, this goes back into even into the 60s and somewhat into the 50s. I don't know if any of you have booked a, a room at the Howard Johnson's lately, but uh, I used to, that was considered the, the, the top of the line. Uh, you drive down Holiday Inn, Howard Johnson's. Uh, uh, how many of you still own a Gateway computer? A uh, Westinghouse. I remember when all the appliances in our home were, if we had any, were Westinghouse. How many of you have a Burroughs uh, adding machine? I mean, it goes on and on. How many of you have been in an Ames department store recently? I'm sure you still, as you watched uh, the, the, the basketball game last night, for those of you who watched that or turned on your television, uh, uh, I'm sure you turned on your Zenith uh, TV. And I, I say that because every one of those companies, and there are many, many more, were led at the time of their, really their peak, were led by men, and in this case, uh, men only, but there were some women that came later, uh, who were these, as I described them, kind of big personalities. They, they were considered great leaders. You never heard their name mentioned unless you heard the descriptor, great leader. And at the time, it was hard to dispute that because their companies were doing well. Now, what happened to those companies well, there are a lot of things that happen. Now, we're looking at public companies, and I realize that most of us are not public company guys, if any of us. 
Now, I would also tell you that whether you are running a business today or whether you're leading a division or whether you are a, a small mid-market company, a startup or one who has been uh, out there for a while but has been kind of stuck in a, a certain range, this information is important to you. Uh, whether you apply it now or you will apply it, it's good for you to know this. But we have to use the public arena as a as kind of the, the model. And, and you say, well, I'm not any of those big companies, but just for a moment, consider that you are a big company in your industry and in your location. And you look at some of those, and I've drawn uh, attention to a few of them. Uh, Dell came along, uh, certainly uh, another great leader in Michael Dell, but they kind of took over Gateway. Marriott and Howard Johnson's, they started at the same time. As a, uh, there's really interesting parallels between all these companies and these, uh, what I call great leaders versus great companies. Uh, the great companies are companies that have, have great leaders. Uh, the companies that had great leaders, there's something unique about them. There's something uh, different about them. They have sustained themselves where those companies like Ames department store was a big deal at one point until Walmart came along. Um, uh, Zenith was, was, the, was the top of the line until Motorola came along. Marriott took over Howard Johnson's. IBM took over Burroughs. GE took over Westinghouse. What was the difference? They all had great leaders. But as I said in the beginning, some of them were building great companies. Some of them were just great leaders. And there is where the difference begins. Today, we might look at that same great leader and we would say they've got a little different persona. It, it's even, uh, you watch the companies that have these, these real uh, iconic uh, personalities. And I'm not discounting that. They, they can be very, they can't be exceptional. But we don't know if they're great leaders at the moment. They may have that title. We may, uh, we may look to them as great leaders, but there is something that happens to determine if you're a great leader. Leaders who focus, and here's what it is, leaders who focus on themselves, they typically are focusing on their money, their fame, their future, their time, their plan. They are not focused on building a company that lasts. A great leader builds a company that lasts. Great leaders who focus on themselves, typically their companies diminish, their companies go away, their companies are taken over. And you say, well, if they're not there, what does that mean? Well, let me give you a, a personal example. Uh, during the 80s, and you've heard me tell a little bit of this story, uh, my partner and I built what we thought in our industry was one of the top five in our industry, which was a large industry, one of the top five uh, management companies in the country. It was, uh, it was drawing a lot of attention. We were beating a lot of the uh, more uh, well-known companies, the more established companies. We were beating them in big markets. We were gaining tremendous market share. We were growing and doing some wonderful things. Here's what I rarely talk about that really was a, a difficult thing for me. When we sold, when I sold the company in the late 90s, I stayed on as chairman for a couple of years. When I left, the company began to fail. The company began to struggle. Now, I, I can make myself feel pretty good about that by saying, well, I told them it would, or I told them what they needed to do not to let that happen. But it was clear, people began to leave, the uh, culture began to change, and the market began to really turn on them. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, uh, but that took a toll on me that I was not expecting. You see, I wanted to build a company that lasted, and I didn't really think about the fact that I might be focusing more on building my legacy than building a company that lasts. Now, I will tell you, I did have a chance to go back in uh, 2005 and reacquire that and, and try to 
make some amends for that, which we uh, hopefully did. But that was a season where this material that I'm presenting to you today became uh, very, very personal to me. So historically, we define historically what we define as a great leader was generally someone who was more focused on themselves and creating a personal legacy that would last. In other words, I want to be famous. I want my legacy to, uh, to last. I want to focus on my time, my money, uh, my experience, my legacy. But here's the, the, the whole point of this. The great, truly great leaders, we can't determine until after they're gone, does their company does it last? Now, we work in the mid-market industry. We work around mid-market leaders like you. We're around for a long time, which I think is good. Uh, we're around oftentimes for 20 plus years doing what we do, where most of those iconic leaders in those public companies have a tenure that's oftentimes less than five years. Uh, and yet they, they, they're, they're just iconic in the way they go across the horizon and make their mark and then leave. And we read about it. We hear about it. But what about those of us who make up the majority of the, uh, uh, the, the industry out there? Those of us who run those $5 million and $20 million and $50 million companies, uh, how do we measure ourselves? Well, part of what we do, we must measure ourselves over how well the company does over time, uh, during our tenure and after our tenure. And it's interesting how many of us don't think about what happens when we're not there, but what happens when we're not there has a lot to do with how we build it while we are there. Uh, I, I often hear, and it's not a, a, in fact, we wrote about it in our book, Short Track CEO, which uh, we talk a lot about the, the, the work that uh, Collins and uh, Porus did in built to last, really a lot of that work we also replicated. And I, I, I would say we did our own studies, but we put a lot of that information in our book. But one of the things that uh, we talk about in there is that there are a lot of ways, a lot of uh, titles we can give you as a business owner or leader. Uh, we talk about the five different styles. But one that I hear more often than others are ones who say to me, I want to build something and sell it, or I want to build something and move on. I'm not sure that's always completely well thought out. In fact, I, I see it as a little bit of a distraction. Uh, if you build something great, uh, you'll have a lot of options to it. If you build something to sell, it's probably, it's probably going to have some, uh, some challenges to it. And we can talk about that at some other time. But the one that I find most interesting and most challenging is I want to build something that will sustain itself where I don't have to do what I'm doing today. I want to be able to, I want to be able to fly the ship remotely or autopilot or whatever. We call it the autopilot uh, leader. And that one's more challenging because really that's the goal is to build a business that that doesn't center around you to build a work that doesn't center around you as much now that's difficult because as as men and women who start our business or buy our business or marry into our business or uh, uh partner into our business so much of it in the early days are built around us and that's understandable but over time there are a couple of things that have to happen in order for you to get to a point where the company, the business can sustain itself without you being the sole a driver and personality of that. And you probably would guess that those, build, those who build companies that last are doing something that the rest of them are not. Let me go back and just, just talk to you a little bit about how that happened with Westinghouse and GE. George Westinghouse uh, created this company in the 20s. Uh, uh, he, he really built it around his sole capabilities as an inventor. He was a, quite an inventor, quite a creator, quite a, 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 a really good engineer. And everything was, had to go through him. Everything had to work through him and had to have his name on it. 
G, at the same time, one of its leading founders, one that's given the most credit, is a guy named Charles Coffin. And Coffin created an organization that could sustain itself without him. Westinghouse says, I've got to do, it's got to be about me. Both of them were successful during their tenure. The same thing happened with Zenith and Motorola. Eugene McDonald was, a, 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 was that iconic personality. They both were formed in uh, Motorola and, and Zenith were both formed in the 20s. Uh, they both started in the radio business. They both were, uh, went into technology. Galvin built the company around uh, something that would sustain itself. Uh, McDonald, everything was focused around him and his personality. Both of them ended up dying in the 50s within 18 months of each other. And uh, Zenith began to diminish um, almost immediately. And you, Motorola became much more of a sustained company because of the way it was built, because of the way it was, was uh, uh, built from the beginning. So uh, leaders have to be organizational architects. They, they really need to have a design on what they're doing. If you want to be a, let's, let's say if you wanna be a great leader, by definition, you have to build a, something that sustains itself, that has a long-term horizon that can do it when you're not around. Now you can be that even while you're there, but if the business has to be built around you, it is likely that that business will not sustain itself when you're not around. And it probably doesn't sustain itself as well while you are there, because at some point you just can't hold it up if it's going to get as big as you want it to be. So what are those guys doing? What are those leaders doing, those individuals doing? Uh, and what was the study that uh, Porus and Collins did uh, that said great leaders who build sustaining companies are doing some things that are, they're, they're really very basic, but they're not built around their personality. Now, I want you to pay attention to these five things. I'm only taking five. Uh, there, there are several others, but I'm only gonna take five. And I would imagine none of you are going to be shocked by any of the five. I doubt any of you are going to look at the five and say, Never thought about that. However, to build an organization that will sustain itself, it's really about building that, that culture around five things. One of them is, a, is the vision. It is important that an organization have a vision about where it wants to go. There's a common theme in all of this that I'm going to share with you. A vision is that ability to say we're, we're going and it gives direction. Uh, it, it gives us a, uh, people need to know where we're going. What's our vision? You could call it strategy. You can call it a lot of different things, but when was the last time that you said to your team, this is where we're going. This is what we're gonna become. This is who we are. We do it as a family. Uh, uh, many of us, we often are caught saying this to our, to our family. Uh, this is who we are. This is the way the Joneses operate. This is the way the Edmondsons operate. Uh, this is our vision as a family. I've talked about that a lot as a father, as a grandfather. I, this is the vision I have for our family. This is where we want to be. This is who we want to be. It's no different for your company. Uh, could your people define that vision? Does it inspire them? Does it direct them? Uh, does it keep them headed? Is it something that's meaningful to them? Uh, it's hard work, folks. Uh, this is not, these are not things that are in a book. You can't go somewhere and say, I need a vision, so here we are. But it is important to have a vision statement. And great leaders focus on these things. That's not something that the, the, oftentimes the, the big personalities want to focus on. Uh, they, want to, they want to focus on other things that direct more attention to them. The second thing that you have to have, and I, 
it's really, I started to put this first, but uh, they all intertwine. You can't do one without the other's purpose. We have a board in our, our, uh, in our conference room, which we created about eight years ago, coming out of this book, Short Track CEO, which is uh, really what are the things that, that you, you've got to understand. And, and all of that I'm taking out of this uh, talk today is, in, is on that board. It's not something we just read in a book somewhere. We actually uh, uh, work on this type of thing, purpose. Uh, purpose is our reason for being. We, we wrote uh, uh, almost an entire chapter in our book, uh, what we call concept four, building your foundation, starting with purpose. So we've got about 45 boxes on this board that you fill out. The first box, the number one box, and I don't know how many companies I've taken through that process, but I've never had one who filled out the purpose in the beginning. They just, it just, I don't know. I don't know what our purpose is. Purpose is not about a profit. Profit's a byproduct of what you do. Purpose is more compelling. Uh, it is the reason you exist. It, it always involves some, something that you want to accomplish that is meaningful. What would happen if you weren't there as a company? What, what purpose do you bring to the table? Purpose is the most, it is the greatest driver that you can give your organization. It is hard, I understand, in business. We talk about purpose on a personal level a lot of times. And oftentimes that can evolve if you started the business or own the business it can evolve into your business purpose but purpose generally always serves somebody else it, it almost always has someone else in the picture what is the reason what is the purpose that you exist uh if if you can't define the the vision and the purpose of your organization i'm not sure it has the legs to, to, to go for a long time. It's hard work. It's frustrating. It's difficult. But great leaders do it. They talk about it. They're not ashamed of it. They're not afraid to. By the way, I don't know of anything that defines culture more than purpose. People aren't going to stay in a culture to follow a purpose that they don't like. Let me give you an example. Uh, we wrote a lot about purpose in our book. Uh, I, I, I may have it in the slides here in a minute. I don't know. But I know uh, we, we listed a number of companies like Merck was to uh, improve life and health of people. Uh, that's a drug company. I mean, we listed a lot of them. The one that took my attention recently and I don't want to be political about it, but um, our friends at Disney, they, I thought they had the greatest purpose. Walmart had the purpose. I want to, they wanted to provide uh, good products and services at a good price for ordinary people. And I must be ordinary because they got stuff in there I like. So Walmart's been through, what, four generations of leadership, maybe three? That's still their purpose. Now, they've had a lot of other distractions along the way, but that's still their purpose. Sam Walton was a great leader because his company survived three, four generations of change. It survived, and that purpose is still there. And you see that purpose. And there's a lot of other political distractions. That, but one of the companies that most recently has come to light is my favorite company of all time, and I thought had the greatest purpose of all time, is to make people happy. You know what that company is, it's Disney. Uh, to make people happy, we're gonna draw cartoons, we're gonna make movies, we're gonna have theme parks, we're gonna have cruise lines, we're gonna do anything and everything to make families happy. That was their purpose. And that purpose survived many generations until what? Recently, they've lost their purpose, haven't they? To some degree. The reason that the prop, the reason that Disney is on the front page in not such a positive way in many places 
is they've gotten away from their purpose. They've moved into other areas. Now that may be more political than you want to hear, but that's what happens when an organization loses focus on its purpose. If their purpose is to make people happy, I, I'm not sure they're, uh, they're accomplishing that right now. Maybe not the way they used to or the way they could. Purpose is important. Uh, number three, if you've been around me very much for very long, you know values are always a topic of conversation. An organization has to have clear, meaningful values. Values are things that, that <clears throat> last. I'm going to give you a test for values in your organization. Your values, whether they're your personal values, and we've talked about that from time to time, personal values versus company values. If you moved into a company and you're in a, a significant part of that organization, you probably you probably your personal values you share them with the with the corporate values if you didn't there there's going to be some conflict but personal values are going to be different than company and corporate values typically unless you're the founder of the company and then they might be very similar values are typically things that don't change they've been around forever they they're they're almost uh un yielding uh, in the way that they drive the organization. And it's not just words on a wall. We live, great leaders talk about values. They celebrate values. They, they live those values. They're consistent with those values. This, the, the, they've been around for a long, long time. They don't just change. You don't change values because your markets change. You don't change values because you introduce new products. You don't change values because you grow geographically. You don't change. Let me tell you, the, 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 the second test in this is, would you want this value to be around after you're gone? Uh, this is hard work. That's why a lot of folks don't do it. And the third test is, are there concrete examples of the organization living those values and and really uh, rewarding those values. I've said many times, the best conversation you can have in your organization is to talk about values and to reward those who are giving great examples of that. So you got vision, you got purpose, you've got values. Uh, the fourth one is what we call in our book, the public agenda, uh, Jim Collins, who is slightly more famous than we are and has sold a few more books than we have. So he calls it the BHAG, the Big Hairy Audacious Goal, which got a lot of attention. <clears throat> if I came into your organization and I was looking for an organization that was building a long-term future, one of the things I would ask the team about is, what is the goal that, you, that excites you about this company that may take you seven, 10, even 20 years to accomplish. What are those things? What is that one thing? One of the great examples that I think Collins put it in his book, he talked about uh, when Cork Walgreen, who was like the third generation in the Walgreens, uh, uh, what used to be known as a soda fountain business, because that's where I grew up, was going to Walgreens soda fountain. In fact, I could do that all the way into the late 70s. There was a great story about how he said, okay, in five years, we're going to be out of soda fountain business, which represented a huge portion of their revenue. But he says that we're out of that business. We're changing our strategy. We're moving in a different direction. Somebody told us, said, we got five, four years to do it. And someone said later, about six months later, said, you know, we've only got four years to get this done. He said, no, you've got three years and six months. Uh, that's our goal. That's where we want to go. That's the BHAC. You need something in your organization that people can say it's, it's our vision is to go there. So vision and your public agenda, public agenda just simply means I'm willing to talk about it. I'm even though people may doubt me, people may not agree that we can do it. And it doesn't need to be something uh, uh, that's crazy. I use the example that if I told you I wanted to run for president of the United States and 2024, you may say, oh, I think that's a little bit bizarre. Well, okay, I want to run for president in uh, two young. elections. Yeah, too young. That's a, that could be a problem. Uh, 
you would say that's not realistic. That's that's unrealistic. And I would agree. But if I said I wanted to get into politics and run for mayor of my city, you'd say, well, that might be a little risky. I don't know why you'd want to do it. I mean, there's a lot of things we could use as examples. Your, your folks need a goal for their vision. They need to know where they're going. It needs to be something that, you know, has maybe a 50, 60% chance of succeeding. It's not guaranteed. It's, it's, I want to be in business in 10 years. It's not a, a BHAG. It's not a public agenda. I want to be here. I want to be doing this. I want to be this size. Uh, it is a common goal that everybody in the organization really believes would be ideal, would be wonderful. Uh, uh, sports teams have this this rite of passage in the spring uh, for football. We want to play for the national championship. Uh, we heard that last night in the basketball. You know, we this was our dream. This was our goal. Well, it's not really a public agenda, but it is. It is for that time of their life. It is. We're all going to commit to it. We're all going to go for it. We all want to be a part of it. We all want to believe in it. Uh, great leaders who build lasting companies have a public agenda that their vision is focused on. And the last thing is your job as an architect is to align all of these things. You got to make sure that your structure, if you take those four things, your values, your vision, your, your purpose and your, and your BHAG, and you can just align those, make sure your structure, your systems, your tools, your culture, your brand, your customer service, your technical processes, even your physical settings, the way people operate, uh, where you give them to operate. That's what leaders do. They serve, they structure, they organize. I wish I had done that and known that in the 80s and 90s it would have drastically changed a number of things that we, we might have done, I might have done. Uh, I, don't, I don't, that's not a remorseful statement. I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased that it worked out as well as it did, but it was painful to leave an organization that you were so proud of, that you'd spent so much time and effort in, and then watch it collapse. And I think the personality oftentimes says, well, there you go, couldn't make it without me. Mine was quite different. That's not a, a, a sign of humility. It was a sign of frustration. Why did it collapse? What happened? And I can go back and pinpoint exactly some of the, some of the mistakes I made, some of the oversights I made, and some of the intentional things I did that were not built for long term. And those are questions that I want you to pose to yourself as you look at today's marketplace. Now, you have to deal with something I did not have to deal with in those days. You have to deal with speed. Things moved much slower then. At least it didn't feel that way then, but it does now. We, we moved much at a much slower pace. Things had a much a different feel than they do today. You, 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 you today, things are moving quickly. Here's my, here's my proposal to you. If you will, as the architect of your division, your company, your department, if you will take time to focus on your vision for your group, if you will talk about the purpose, if you will instill and drive values, uh, you will begin to you begin to build something that people will be drawn to, and those who aren't drawn to it will go away. They will they will not want to be a part of that, and it will sustain itself because you will start to develop those who come behind you. We know, in especially in privately held businesses, the best leaders oftentimes come from within. Oftentimes, we just don't spend the time to develop them. And let me 
suggest to you that if you're doing those those things, you're developing leaders, uh, people who can do those, who subscribe to those, who follow those, are actually demonstrating leadership skills. Uh, if they're coming behind you, if they subscribe to the purpose and they subscribe to the values and they subscribe to the vision, uh, they're coming along behind you uh, and can be developed as leaders. So as you are doing those things, you are teaching, you are leading, uh, you're building something that lasts. And I would tell you one of the more one of the more satisfying parts of your career will be if you're able to look back and see that you built something that lasts, something that didn't go away. And during the time you're doing it, you're actually relieving some of the stress and pressure that you're feeling because so much depends on you. And great leaders never stop building their companies because they really want them to last. So here's, here's the kind of the end result of all of this. Don't define a great leader by their personality, by their ego, by their, the, the, what they accomplish always during their tenure. You have to look at what happened when they left. You have to look at what happens when they're not there. Now, some of that you can do even during their residency, but a lot of times, if you're building something to last, uh, you're building something of great value. So those are my thoughts. Uh, Shad asked me to put some things together for today. And uh, I, I, I'm bringing history to you as a leader. Uh, you have to be a good psychologist today. You have to be, a, uh, it helps if you're a, a good marketer. It, it, it really uh, helps if you're a, a, a good economist a good librarian, if you got a lot of good books on your shelf that you've read. It helps to be uh, good with numbers. It helps to be good with uh, legal things, but it really, really helps to be a good historian. Look at what's worked in the past. Uh, project what you believe needs to be done in your company. But as I look down the board of folks that are on this call, knowing many of you and what your role and responsibilities are, uh, those are the things that I would encourage you to give thought to. They're hard. The words are not hard. The concepts are not hard. But when you start to fill in the box, it's hard. Challenge yourself to build something that lasts, not something that has a big payday coming in a short time or builds your comfort level. Uh, you won't enjoy that as much. So those are my thoughts. Uh, uh, Shad, I think what I'll do now is open it up for questions or turn it over to you to explain whatever I didn't explain. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, we've got time. So I'd love any immediate responses or questions, remarks, additions um, from the group while we have a minute. Hey, uh, Ken, Shad, I was just wondering, you mentioned the vision. Is your vision in your mission statement or where does that fit in the purpose and the vision fit in with mission statement? Or is that totally separate? Just, just curious about your take on that. It's interesting, uh, Rick, if, if, if I heard your voice, I recognize your voice, I think. Uh, the, often, the word vision didn't really start to show up until the 90s. It's an old, uh, used, worn-out word for a lot of people. But we really didn't start using that word until about the 90s. Mission statement also kind of uh, uh, took over, uh, kind of hijacked the purpose statement. So mission oftentimes is synonymous with your BHAG. It's oftentimes synonymous with your vision. It's oftentimes synonymous with your purpose. So I'm good with whatever word you want to use in there. Everybody seems to have a mission statement. What I find in most mission statements is a, a, a kind of a confluence of goals. We want to be this. We want to be that. And they're oftentimes kind of conflicting. We want to be great to our shareholders and we want to be great to our customers and we want to be wonderful to our employees. And you got to be careful with that. But 
the vision to me and the and the public agenda uh, and the purpose they do connect. It's like a train, and I always go purpose, vision, BHAG, uh, values, and and they kind of all work together. But mission is fine if you want to replace purpose with mission. If you want to replace uh, mission with vision, uh, but I think the word purpose and vision uh, are more, uh, I think they're cl more clear, but you don't hear those words as, as often uh, as you do the word mission state. We, you always say, uh, if you go on most websites, including many of yours, you'll see values and you'll say mission statement. And a mission statement is also almost always a brand statement. Uh, it's kind of like an advertisement. Um, you don't see many companies out there that say our purpose is, our values are, uh, our vision is. Uh, and maybe that's okay. That's, that's oftentimes very private, but your people need to know what that is. So I think the words matter, but I'm okay with mission as long as you don't throw everything underneath that as purpose and vision and, and, and BHAG. But those words, if, if you really use those three separate distinctions, you get clear on what the difference is in purpose and my, and my vision and my BHAG. Rick, does Again, that- I had a question. All right. Good. Go ahead, Andy. Rick, the uh, you know, you talked about the beginning about um, great leaders, you know, aren't, aren't necessarily focused on themselves and, and the difference in a great company that can run without the great leader. Um, how do you know if you're creating a company that strictly revolves around you? Is there, is there some sort of like self-evaluation or self-test or is that a, um, you know, how kind stressed of are you? Thin, kind of deal? <laughs> How stressed am I? We're moving Friday. <laughs> building. I'm pretty freaking stressed right now. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, there, if there's like a like a kind of self evaluation or how you how you would how you would. Andy, that. I I thought about that a lot, uh, kind of in a similar way to what you ask. Uh, and that's where I don't like what I the answer I get oftentimes. Um. If and and I, be careful. I want to be careful with this because I think it's important not to be too uh, destructive in my in my self evaluation or my evaluation of others. I my sense is particularly we we tend to be more self focused on our position, our goals, uh, our needs. We've said in the book in uh, next level leadership. Uh, and, and Chad will have to correct my quote here, uh, but we said that the idea is we want more for you than from you. It's really the idea, and there's a statement in there, and I wrote it, I should remember it, but it was really that statement that you have to ask yourself, am I really, really willing to, to give or sacrifice for this business and my people? Uh, or am I doing this you know, privately for myself? So I, I think you have to really have, a, have a, 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 your own evaluation. Certainly early on, Andy, and for most of you, you become, the, you become very critical to the business. I don't want to insinuate that you're not important to the business, that you will always be important to the business, but you, we, that's the reason we look at uh, uh, assessments a lot to see what kind of a uh, uh, what kind of a manager you're going to be. Uh, and uh, one of the big big concerns that I have, in fact, I even talked to Shad about it this morning. Is you know I've I've spent forty plus years and I've got a control mechanism that uh, I thought I think I, I think oftentimes limited me from developing people. I wanted to control. You go out and do this. Mm -hmm. And then come back and tell me how you did, and I'll tell you if you did it right or not. Uh, 
So I, I think there's a lot of personal evaluation in that. But uh, uh, Shad's probably got some thoughts about it. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's a question, you know, as a leader, I'm constantly asking myself, I think um, when I'm focused more on my personal security, it really clouds my ability to focus on what the organization needs. And it puts me in a position where I think I'm more likely to compromise values and vision. Um, and so I think I've got to be really aware of when I'm when I'm feeling insecure, either financially or relationally um, or just pragmatically in the position I, I can get really clouded on and even hearing even hearing Ken talk about this it was kind of a reset a really healthy reset for me that brought a lot of peace because it was a good reminder of why what am I trying what are we trying to build what are we trying to create and the hard work of establishing those values and and, and to Rick's question I see vision as the thing that we will never stop pursuing that we'll never fully realize. Like the vision is this, if, if I could accomplish everything that I'd hope to accomplish and see this through this hope that I have that's so big and bigger than me that I need a lot of help and support and structure and systems. And so the vision is bigger. The mission is kind of, all right, this is the part we are going to play in this greater hope that we want to contribute to because <laughs> uh, that's when you get the really the beautiful idea of community right is all these parts working in unison to accomplish the whole so your vision and then your mission and the values are like this is how we're going to fight like these are the things we're going to this is how we're going to approach this overall so i think this whole thing is for me just been a really it's such a good reset um so really uh really appreciate the, the overview, the content, the reminders, but like you said, it's, they're not difficult concepts, but if we're going to do it in a really, in, in a really intellectually honest way of, of really knowing what do I say I value and what do we really value, the closer you get to what you truly value, the more authentic you will be in your leadership, the more integrated you will be in your leadership, the less stress you will have be managing because you're not trying to perform to be something and prove that you're something you're not. So the exercises themselves are just always worth wrestling with, I think, but really good questions. Uh, we, we did say, Shad, I, I, it's, on, it's in chapter nine of our book, uh, 104, uh, page 103. It says the most challenging and difficult self-assessment. It's always good to go back and read what you read or, or read what you wrote. <laughs> Uh, the most challenging and difficult self-assessment a leader can make is to look in the mirror and ask themselves, quote, do I really care about the success of my people and my company as much or more than my own? Mm -hmm. That is a, that is a, a, a significant uh, measurement. Now, let me just close my portion by saying to us all, those are, those those are the standards, the goals that we should uh, strive for. We're going to fail. We're going to miss it. We're going to, I'm not asking you to, to, you know, give away everything you got and, you know, go live in the, on the street uh, to prove a point. But there is a, I think there's a standard you ask yourself, if you, if you keep that banner over your, over your head, if you keep that banner in your mind, do I really care about success of my people and my company more than my own? That's a heroic, great leader uh, evaluation, and and that's the standard that I would that I would offer. And uh, I can't tell you that I've always done that, and and I've I'm talking about it now, kind of in retrospect. That's really good. Um, so I'll just close uh, our time out and um, just by saying one, thanks a bunch for joining us. Um, Please know that in our private Facebook group and our private LinkedIn group, we're constantly sharing thoughts, ideas, um, things that we are passionate about, care about, that we think are relevant to our leadership and to yours. Feel free to invite other leaders to join that, um, to join that space and join that conversation. Um, we restrict labs typically to people that are members of the private Facebook group or the Next Level alumni or community. Um, so love seeing people kind of trickling into that space and um, really enjoy sharing uh, content and resources there. 
Um, number two, we are launching our fourth next level cohort, which is really exciting. So, you know, we started this with uh, kind of this experiment um, a, a couple of years ago, and it's just been a lot of fun working on it with Ken um, and seeing it kind of develop and evolve and us continue to get better at how we organize it and execute it. Um, we truly love um, building relationships with you and walking alongside of you on this journey and being some measure of support. So if you know any other leader that you think would benefit from learning more about Next Level, especially those of you who have experienced it firsthand, um, please uh, let us know. Now's the time. We'll be starting their assessment work late April, early May. And, um, and we're also in the process. We're, uh, I will be getting final pricing for the second time on the training room that we're wanting to build out um, at, in the building I can see from my window here at Ken's office on the other side of Kirby Woods Baptist in Memphis. But uh, so we're excited about that space, at least at some point, uh, or, you know, in the first half of this year, where we'll be able to host some things with everybody and do our and, and, and have our class in that space. It'll also allow us more fluidly, uh, fluently, more effectively uh, to um, host a hybrid class. So people that are joining from outside of Memphis beyond that can participate via Zoom and get a really high quality experience um, participating with us that way. So lots of fun stuff happening. Really grateful that y'all are a part of it. And um, if you want to reach out and have follow-up conversations, any of this stuff, uh, as always, feel free to reach out. We'd love to connect. Um, our next lab, lastly, will be on May 3rd, and I'll post that and share that with y'all as well, but that'll be May 3rd um, at 9.30. If you're an alumni uh, or a student, a current current member, we I, I email you guys an invitation to that, so you get that uh, right in your inbox. Um, for everybody else, just keep your eye out and email and um, Facebook, but May 3rd, 9.30, and uh, we'll be back together again. And that's all I got. Thanks, Thanks, team. Thanks, Glad to be with yeah, you. Yeah, guys. Lead well. Go get them. <laughs>